Cheers, everybody. Good morning, allies. Um, I thought I would do a nice, simple little video on my recommendation for tools. Tools that I use when I do my soldering projects, electronics, all that goodness. Should be a quick little video, hopefully, um, but I'm happy to get your questions. If you want to ask me anything, um, feel free to post in the comments and we'll just, uh, we'll just dive right in. Okay, guys? All right, so let me, let me make sure I've got my my view going, I can see the chat. Excellent. Where is the chat actually? I kind of don't like the way. There we go. Uh, I see what they did. Hmm. Not a fan of that. Okay, anyway, we're moving on. So um, here is just a swath here in the middle here of all the tools that I, I recommend. And you can go to the description for links to most of this stuff. Um, Obviously, you're going to need a soldering iron to do any soldering projects. Makes sense, right? Lots to talk about there. Um, obviously, the, the major point is that you just you get a soldering iron and you start soldering, right? Start with that. Something that can get hot, doesn't have to be amazingly expensive. It just needs to be, hey, what's up, Nico? Uh, it just needs to be something that will work. There are analog soldering irons and there are digital soldering irons. Analog soldering irons take a while to heat up. Um, like this one is an analog model. Basically, um, it uses kind of a rheostat, you can see here, to set the temperature. You just kind of use the jog wheel. Um, <laughs> there's no numbers here, right? So it's it's kind of misleading. You don't know exactly what you got, like more heat. Oh, this soldering iron goes to 11, right? It doesn't really give you a lot of information. Um, the key thing to remember about soldering irons is that you can overheat projects. You don't want to do that. Um, and also, you don't want to be too cold because if it's too cold, you're going to get a poor solder link. Um, some things to think about. Analog is fine. Digital is a bit nicer because when you start it, it gets hot very quickly and you can accurately digitally dial in exactly the temperature that you want. Um, some things to think about when you get a soldering iron. Make sure you get a tip that's nice and, and small so you can get in there on exactly the component you want. Make your, your heat, apply your heat, get your solder on there, boom. Um, soldering irons that have an easy to remove tip are nice. This is a very easy to remove tip. This is more of the analog style. You'll see something like this is very simple. It just gets really hot, right? That's the, there's an anode or whatever in here that, that gets hot. And uh, this one has kind of been my workhorse for years and years. It's probably going to go to the garage um, once I get that all, my garage uh, workbench area set up. My digital one though, which is behind the Plano box that I will talk about, this is a much better unit. Um, I recommend that if you've got the money to spend. Soldering irons are relatively cheap. Um, spend a little bit more money, get a better unit. Some notable brands are Weller and Hako. I think that's how you pronounce Hako. Those are very, very good soldering irons. Um, item two, this is a solder tip cleaner. A lot of soldering irons, when you buy them, come with this, these dinky little sponges. Okay, these sponges suck. Um, if you if you've ever really done any work with soldering, you know that these sponges are just garbage. So don't don't mess around with these. You know it often sits there, and you're supposed to wet it and dip the tip in it and clean it off. Blah blah blah. Don't get one of these guys. What this is is a like a, a Scotch Bright Brillo pad, right? It's this metal material. And all you do when you're soldering, um, you tin the tip. Tinning the tip just means applying solder directly to the tip, get it hot. And then you just take it and you dive it, you just dip it like that, stab it in there. And what it does um, is it perfectly cleans the tip off so that there's just the perfect amount of solder on it. I, I love this thing. Particularly when you're making a lot of connections, you're going to want um, something like this. So that's that. Big recommendation on that one. Um, I'll move right into desoldering. Oh, obviously. <laughs> obviously, you have to have solder, right? Obviously, you need to have solder, too. I'm not that picky about my solder. A lot of people are very picky. Usually, it's a 60-40 um, split between rosin and solder. Your call. You're going to find things that you like, things you don't like. I've had this MG Chemicals No Clean um, SN63 PB37, so that's a little bit more than 60-40. 
uh, solder for a very long time. This is 22 gauge. Smaller the gauge means uh, that you can work on smaller projects. The smaller the diameter, right? So you can get in there really nicely if you're doing precision work. So smaller solder is good. I've got a bunch of solder. I'm not picky about it. You can choose whatever you like, and as you get better, you'll become picky or find something you like. Uh, desoldering. So what's desoldering? Well, desoldering is when you have either uh, put a component in the wrong spot, or you apply too much solder, or you are um, taking apart. So like this piece here, I've got a circuit board that I want to pull things off of, like this oscillator, this crystal oscillator, and some transistors. I'd like to keep those, right? I want to salvage them, right? So you need to desolder. How do you do that? Well, one way is what's called desoldering wick. And I'm really just covering this so you know, but it's not my preferred method. It's a flat copper um, braided wick. And what you do is you put the wick in between the soldering iron and the solder on the board that you're trying to pull away. And what will happen is as the copper heats up and equalizes to the temperature of the solder and the PCB and the, and the board, um, the solder will, will wick into this, literally wick, um, into the braid and that's how you can desolder. You'll literally pull the solder into the braid. Well, I don't really like doing it this way. Although, um, in some instances, you have to use soldering braid, or it's preferred uh, for surface mounts and some other stuff, it, it can be handy. So, have it. It's very inexpensive. Um, what I prefer is a sucker, a solder sucker. And what this is is a plunger. You push it down like that. You take the tip of this little hole, right? Take the tip, put it right next to the PCB, take your soldering iron, dip it in there. Once the solder becomes liquid, you push the button and it sucks the solder through this hole. This is much easier. It's much easier to use. The downside for the solder sucker is that you have to clean the sucker out a lot. Like I'm already seeing it's all gunked up in there. Um, this tip will get full of solder and you'll have to go in there and, and, and clean it out. Things to note, right, there's actually like a metal pole, right, the, the CSL thing, this metal guy. This is what clears the path so that you can constantly use it, um, but it, it gets stuck and slows down and then you have to clean it out. And to clean it out, you just unscrew the ends. Very simple. I think it's like $5 on Amazon for a um, braid and solder sucker. Very inexpensive. Um, I should probably mention price. Most of this stuff um, you can buy and you can be under $100 and working on projects, kits. That's great. Um, you spend more money, you get better quality stuff. Um, you can go, the sky's the limit, soldering irons, you can get really expensive on some high quality digital soldering irons. You may not want to go that route to begin with. So you may not want something that has a little base station. Going back to uh, soldering irons, you just may want to get just a cheap little, um, cheap little soldering iron like this. Spend 10 bucks, 20 bucks, figure out if you enjoy soldering or not. No big deal. And if you don't, you can give it to somebody and, you know, give it to a kid. Get them involved in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, is that science? Whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, moving right along. <clears throat> Let's talk about all these cutters and wire strippers and, and vice versa. So, um, in my right hand, I am holding needle nose pliers and what's called a diagonal cutter. In my left hand, I am holding what is called a wire stripper, or cutter, or whatever. So, the wire stripper I keep in my electronics go bag. It's my tool bag. Um, it's actually this bag right here. It's in the background. Uh, when I'm on the go, I have a portable soldering iron um, that it runs off butane. Not recommended for projects or anything like that, but. Um, I have a small set of tools, and I've used it very successfully in the field, working on car electronics, um, working on whatever, just when you're away from home and you need a soldering iron. This is kind of a, a do-everything pair of pliers. I don't necessarily recommend this for projects, and I bet you've never really seen me pull this out when I work on my projects on my desk, when I do the live streams like I'm doing right now. Never really use this thing. Why? Well, this is why. Everything that that this all you this all-in-one tool can do, um, these do just as well or better or more precisely, and they're less expensive. Uh, these are very precise needle-nose pliers, which is what you want for projects. Um, if you're trying to hold up a, a component 
with the tip on these, which is a little plier head, you're not you're not going to do that great. <laughs> it's, it's just not going to be comfortable to do. Plus, you've got you know, you're holding a component like this, and you've got your soldering iron, and you're trying to come in on it. It's just no bueno. These are much better. Um, these are you want spring spring loaded so that they they want to fly open, right? And that's what you want. Those are very nice. This is by the Crescent Company. Very inexpensive. I believe that um, the, the, this exact angle cutter and these pliers are add-on buys on Amazon, which means like once you get your cart to like 25 bucks or something like that, you can add these in and they're stupid cheap. I think that these pliers, this one, this angle cutter is like five bucks. So obviously the wire strippers strip wire. So what do you, how do you strip wire? You're not really stripping wire with you know, those pliers. I use the angle cutters. I use the angle cutters almost always for stripping wire. And all you do is um, you take the flat side, the flush side, and you point that in the direction of where you want the insulation to go. And that right angle blade um, on the, the diagonal cutters does great. Um, it, it works just as well as, as anything for, for stripping wires or whatever you're doing. So I recommend these two pliers, particularly these two pliers, and the link is in the description. They're insanely cheap. You can spend tons more money and get better pliers, but unless you're a professional, you're not really going to need it. So, moving along. Uh, magnetic little dish for screws. This is this is a no-brainer. If you have a Harbor Freight in your area, they're practically giving these away. There's a sale going on this weekend for Memorial Day. Go get one, two, five, six. I think I've got somewhere in the order of five or six of these things floating around. If you have a Daiso in your area, Daiso sells this particular one that I've got. Um, they're just stupid cheap, so go get them. Okay, precision screwdrivers. So everybody's got like those uh, thin, knurled precision screwdriver. Everybody has that, a set of those. Those are garbage. Um, get rid of them. Well, don't get rid of them. Just keep them as a backup to your good precision screwdrivers. I am uh, linking in the description to a set of precision screwdrivers that are very similar to this set of precision screwdrivers, but I couldn't find this particular one. These are made by the General. Um, it's a six-piece set. comes with three flathead, three, um, three Phillips. I just have two here as an example. Here are my recommendations. Large size, so you get a large purchase. Uh, much better than those stupid round neural things. I hate those things. And uh, the head that spins. Or the, I don't know what you call this. Whatever you call this. The reason is, and this is how you use them, you just go on your part and you hold with your, your pointer finger and you spin between your thumb and your middle finger. Very easy. The advantage of precision screwdrivers that have a larger purchase, larger body, thicker handle, is that you can apply the right torque to release stuck screws. Particularly, this is valuable when you are desoldering or you're working on projects where you're taking things apart. Um, it's nice to have a, a thick screwdriver for when you inevitably get on a PCB screw or a screw that's on a PCB and it's it's stuck for whatever reason. Those little neural screwdrivers are great when the um, when the screw is spinning freely. It, it, actually, they're the same as these when the screw is spinning perfectly smoothly. But when it's a little chunky, a little dirty, a little stuck, you want something that's thicker so you get better leverage. Okay, so why is there another screwdriver here? Well, this is an Exalite um, screwdriver, the X101. I am very specifically recommending this screwdriver. I love this screwdriver. This brand and this model screwdriver has been in my life since I started working on computers. Not this one, but this style has remained unchanged since I started working on computers, and I absolutely love um, love these screwdrivers. I don't know why. I don't. I, I have some uh, weird affiliation for them. I don't get it. I found no real good link to them on Amazon, so um, find out where wherever you can get a hold of them. Buy one of these suckers. These things are great. I absolutely love them. I've worked on uh, countless computers with an Exalite X101. I've worked on tons of electronics with these. Love them. Now, why am I recommending this and the precision screwdrivers? Well, this thing, these are great for taking cases apart, taking things apart um, when you're working on project boxes or a computer case, right? Stuff like that. Perfect. This is 
perfect. The best, my favorite. One of my favorite things for sure is, is this dumb plastic screwdriver. I got this at a store that specializes in electronics kits and projects and um, professional grade electronics work. They sell capacitors and resistors and, and all kinds of beautiful stuff and, and they they sell these like crazy. And this is cheap, this is five bucks I think, I think. Anyway, get yourself a good set of screwdrivers. Now, um, we're talking about projects, soldering projects, um, electronics projects. If you are um, interested in electrician work, like house electronics, stuff like that. This is not the, the right screwdriver. This is, it's, there's, there's no insulation to protect you. I don't, I'll, actually, I should have pulled this out so I can show you. One second. Uh, the, the goal of this video was not to talk about this, but this is my, my hip pouch for when I'm working on house electronics. Um, it's got some tape. I've got some wire nuts down in the bottom. I've got this great, I love this thing, little circuit checker, very simple, um, if you've got a hot line or not. Anyway, these screwdrivers are what you recommend for um, working on household electron, household wiring, whatever. Notice that the insulation goes all the way to the tip. That's to protect you as the user. This does not have insulation like that. So keep that in mind. This is good to have, but this is a separate thing. Um, not You don't need this stuff for projects. Keep that in mind. Okay, what's next? Ah, yes. The multimeter. One of the most important things you can have. Um, and actually, the multimeter is probably my most lacking thing that I have in my kit. I'm using this, uh, and the reason is I had one burn out on me that I was relatively happy with. This is my Garden Bender Digital Multimeter GDT311. I'm not telling you that because I want you to buy it. I'm telling you that because you don't want to buy this. Projects, um, when you work on projects, it's really nice that your multimeter has an audible tone for if there is, um, if there is continuity. Continuity tone is very helpful for when you're working on projects. What do I mean by continuity tone? Well, you can attach one leg, right, the negative post or the ground post, to the ground, and then you can use the red post, your positive line, to probe around your board and check that your components have continuity, and you get an audible tone that they have continuity. You don't have to look up at the screen, you don't have to apply power necessarily. You're just checking for continuity. I am. I've linked to a Fluke multimeter uh, in the description. So that is about as cheap as you can get of high quality with a good audible um, continuity checker. So that is what I recommend. I will probably be buying one of those in the future. To go along with your multimeter, it is a really good idea to make jumper cables. Um, these are quite simply just wire with two alligator clips on each end. These are helpful for when you want to kind of, when you're working on a breadboard or working on whatever, you can attach one of the legs, click into a jumper on the breadboard, and click the other, clip the other one onto um, your probe on your multimeter. For example, your negative lead. That will allow you to only have one hand probing the positive for the components. Makes things very easy. You don't have to mess with two hands. You don't have to do any of that stuff. But very, very nice. Totally recommended. <clears throat> so I said breadboards. I recommend you get a breadboard. And I would recommend you get a long breadboard. As big a breadboard as you can, you can find <laughs> or buy. Uh, the reason is small breadboards limit you to small projects. Large breadboards can um, handle much larger projects if you decide you want to get into larger projects. Not to say you have to. You can still do small projects on a large breadboard, but having a large breadboard gives you options. So, large breadboard, recommended. I know I'm holding a small breadboard, but <laughs> trust me when I say that. A uh, bunch of wires. Just have a ton of wire. Just 
just buy wire. Whenever you come across something cheap, if you're at a swap meet and somebody's selling wire cheap, buy it. Uh, multiple gauges, but I think this is a uh, 22 gauge. Not positive. Um, also, <laughs> as this is totally, look at this, just a total mess. It's flying all over the place. See how this one is very nicely, nicely held in place with this very simple rubber band. The rubber bands, have a lot of rubber bands if you're going to have a lot of wire spools on hand because they turn into a complete mess like that. Uh, a vise. So this is not specifically a PCB vise. There are uh, things called PCB vices that I recommend. PCB vices are for holding PCBs while you're soldering. You're going to need that, so just, just get one. Um, they can be purchased relatively inexpensively on Amazon, highly recommended. To go along with that, there's something called a helping hands. Helping hands is a uh, two alligator clips, and you can adjust them all over the place, and you can hold on to things while you are soldering, because you will find <laughs> often that um, one hand is holding solder and the other hand is holding an iron. Well, what's holding the board, or well, what's holding the component you want to attach to the board, um, what's holding the wire, what's holding this, what's holding that. There's tons of reasons why you need a third hand. Um, I'm actually recommending a kind of newer school model than this one in Amazon. So go check that out. This is very old school. I don't know where I got this. Somebody gave this to me. But um, this is the kind of the old style of doing helping hands, third hand, whatever you want to call it. Um, they are much different nowadays. So anyway, keep that in mind. What else? Ah, parts. Parts and parts holding containers. I picked this up at the Dollar Tree. This is a Plano box, tackle Plano box, that I've repurposed for components. You can see I have electrolytic capacitors, I have all forms of resistors, I have electrolytic mics, I have all kinds of trim pots and capacitors, resistors, all kinds of great stuff crammed in here. And uh, these are really nice for organizing your parts. There are a myriad of ways that you can organize your parts. There's no right answer. Just pick what you like. I happen to like the Plano boxes. I find that having them seal up is really nice so that you don't have parts flying all over the place. Because I'm very klutzy and prone to dropping things and prone to having things explode and throw their parts all over the place. These are nice though. These are cute because you can uh, you can build out a project almost completely in these in these containers here. And uh, and then you and then you can be like, hey, this is my this is my FM transmitter spy box. And in fact, I have one of those somewhere. Where did it go? I will show you if I can find it. No doubt, one of my children probably grabbed it and took it somewhere. Hmm. That's a sad day. Anyway, I won't belabor that. <clears throat> but. With a bit of forethought, you can be like, hey, I'm just going to um, kit everything out, put all my parts, my different resistors, my different capacitors, all in this little box, seal it up, and be like, okay, I'm ready to go. Whenever I have a free moment, I can go ahead and work on that project. Excellent idea. Okay. Um, components. So this is a nice little um, disk capacitor kit. Look at these. All these different disk capacitors. I think I picked this up on Amazon for like seven bucks. And it comes in a pretty janky case, but it keeps everything separated and it has a nice little sticker there to tell you the values for for all these different uh, Pico, and it's in Pico Farad, 50 volts. These are all 50 volts. Very nice design, very nice idea. Great, <laughs> you know, what, seven bucks? And you got all these capacitors? That's gonna last you a long time. Um, kind of rolling around the end here. I took a, you know, the top of little cheap toolboxes. I use this as a caddy for um, screws, and obviously this is an antenna here, right? Different uh, LCD. I I'd like to have just a dump tray that I can throw things into while I'm working. It makes things um, tidy, keeps things some form of chaos and control. 
yeah, so that's pretty much it. I will I will give an honorable mention, even though it's kind of not... You're not going to find a lot of Torx screws. Um, I've had this screwdriver for a very long time. They have changed this. It's no longer um, this style. They've, they've made a, a pretty significant change to it. This is the Husky brand Torx bit set, and I believe it has eight different bits. They're double-sided, so it has three, four bits four bits, but they're double-ended, so eight. And in the rear here is a holder for all these great little Torx bits. I love this thing. I don't use it very often for electronics. It is more often than I use this to tighten up the, um, the hinge on my knives. Most of my knives are Torx. Um, do I have a knife on me? Of course I do. So this is a Spyderco Delica, and guess what? Flip it over, they're all Torx. Everything is Torx, 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 Torx. And I already have the right bit in for doing all the tightening on the body and tightening the uh, the clip. If you're gonna have knives, um, you should you should just get one of these these multi Torx bit kits. Totally recommend it. So big thumbs up on that. Um, yeah, and that is probably gonna do it for the tools. So what I want to do now is let me get some stuff out of the way because I want to talk about the next project. I haven't actually figured out yet what I want to do um, next week, most likely. We'll have another um, Let's Build Live. And I'm thinking, let me uh, let me flip over here. Yeah, okay. Let me get in, in focus. Bloop. What's up, guys? Okay, so I'm, I'm on this website. QRP kits, and they have uh, very cool, different, all these kits on the side, uh, antennas and transceivers. A transceiver is a radio that receives and transmits. It's a transceiver. They have transmitters, only transmitting. Um, they have receivers, only receiving. Different accessories. There are easy series kit. Well, let's, let's go to the easy series kit. Easy transmitter switch bypass filter. Oh, oh, maybe we should do that. How hard is that? So, uh, what's hold on? Um, DF filter, DF filter, which I believe is no direction finding, direction finding. Banking filter. Mm. Okay. Let's. Jesus. Fox hunting. Radio. Mm. Okay. Filter. Did you need to have. This is really bothering me. Here we go. Where can I get an enclosure? So I need an offset attenuator. Offset attenuator. There's a project, that's good. Um, so, an offset attenuator is, okay, capacitor, capacitor, resistor, capacitor, diode, oscillator, uh, 4,000 megahertz, BNC front, audio, tape, hot, 5K, perf board, okay, so I have all this. Great, all their images suck, and they don't have an image. Um, they don't have an actual circuit diagram. Oh, okay, there we go. I can work with that. So, what is a um, offset attenuator? So, when you're um, direction finding, so um, this is a really good idea. We're going to do this, and um, I'll actually probably go a next step 
and then do a series of videos on this. And it needs to be a part of the ham radio crash course eventually, so you're kind of all in my brainstorming right now, up in my head. So what's behind me here, and this is just happens to work out this way, this is a uh, beam antenna. See the yellow legs of this white PVC pipe? That is a antenna that you point in a direction and it receives and transmits like in a beam focused array of radio. Um, with an offset attenuator you can close that in. So let's say there was a radio station that was spuriously transmitting non-stop you know it's just it's just let's call it a jerk call them lids in the ham radio world you got this lid and this guy won't get off the repeater or you won't get off this frequency and he's just calling everybody every name in the book is really offensive dude you can um, you can use a beam antenna to zero in you know circle around right so if I'm if I point the beam antenna 45 degrees away from where he's transmitting I don't hear anything and then I start moving in and boom the signal gets really loud I'm pointed at him so I make a mark like uh, using GPS or whatever here's where I am then I go a mile down the road like perpendicular as perpendicular as I can get do the same thing beam boom take a GPS um, do it again boom that's triangulation what did we just do we just draw straight lines now from those points and where those lines intersect that's relatively where that person is transmitting so then you start getting closer and closer and as you get closer you use the offset attenuator to dial back the, the efficiency effectiveness of your beam antenna so um, maybe that would be a fun project of course in, not many of you guys are doing this though, so you may not you may not have any interest in that. Hmm. Let me pretty quiet today on the YouTubes. Thanks for everybody that's watching by the way. So that's that's a way we could go. Let's go back here to the, the QRP kits though. So I would like to do kits for new builders. Dummy load, microphone, RF probe, power attenuator, easy low pass, easy low pass filter. Eh. Dummy load. Ah, move. Wow, that's a lot of soldering there, huh? Maybe not. Okay, let's look at transceivers really quick. So they've got a couple of them. Multi-band direct conversion. Survivor, 75 your single sideband, tri-bander CW, 40 meter CW, oh, no surface mounts, single sideband transceiver 17, 20 meter single sideband, okay let's take a look, okay, so that's a transceiver that is single side, ooh it's $190, okay we will be passing on that, I think I know, ooh, three band portable Field radio. That can't be cheap. That cannot be cheap. 275. That's what I thought. That thing looks pretty awesome. That does three bands, 20 meter, 30 meter, and 40. Uh, and it is... looks like CW. Okay. If at any time I am using terms that you don't understand, feel free to ask in the comments below. So I think, I think I'm gonna pass on these for a second. What do I wanna do? I want to tuna can radio. So I found that these guys, 
they're quite interesting. They make uh, these tuna can radios. Mint tin friendly. Let me show you. Kits and tuna cans. There you go. So literally, it's a it's a kit uh, that comes in a tuna can. Pretty pretty ingenious. Tuna they switched in. Ooh, tuna tuner. Okay, maybe not. Tuna power system. That's funny. Dummy load. Kids kit. Oh, so it's just seed. It's an oscillator. Tuna can soldering tip cleaner. So if you're interested in getting the thing that I recommended earlier, and they've got a tuna can version of it. I da, 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 tuna complete. Three hundred. What the? F what is this? This is. I don't know what I'm looking at. This is a forty meter. Why is it two hundred and twenty-five dollars though? The Beaconator is a reworked version of the bill of the Beaconator. The kit is an upgraded to include several new features. I why are you not why are you not showing me pictures and telling me what it is? Hmm. Ooh. That's interesting. Oh, the sudden transmitter for the QV. Okay. Bop, 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 bop. What's lobster? Okay. <laughs> Jesus. These guys are having fun. So these kits, um, if you go to like a ham radio convention, they'll have these build offs, and it's not like a competition. It's just for everybody to go to one place and then build, um, build their kits together. It's very. It's fun. The purpose of the kit is to provide a novel display to monitor the output of your QRP transmitter. To help a board has a lot of limerick pads on the underside of the PCB. Kits by function. Okay, let's go to transceiver. Nice. So 40 bucks. 40 bucks gets you this kit here, which is a transceiver. It is single band, single crystal oscillator. I'm assuming you, yeah, 40 meter crystal. So it's, a, it's locked to a single frequency. Eh. I think I want to build a power supply. I think I want to do that. Yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna do. I keep telling myself I'm gonna I'm gonna get real and build myself a power supply for powering all these kits, so I think I'm gonna do that. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure how I will tell you all about that. How will I do that? Let me think about it. Yeah, I know how to use a power supply. That's not what I'm worried about. But we need, we need to build one. So there's, now you're talking. Look at that. That's a real kit project right there. Yeah, no joke. You got ground, five volts, 12 volts, on and off. Boom. Pretty simple stuff. Sine wave. Okay. Oh, wait. There you go. So you've got a transformer here. That's that gold thing. Uh, big old capacitor. A couple of resistors, electrolytic capacitors. Big old heat sink for the MOS. Is that a MOSFET? Anyway. Hmm. 
No, get me out of here. Oh my god. Thank you. You can build a power supply using a computer. Ooh, look at that. Using a computer power supply, which we may do. Oh, damn. Look at that. There's an IC, a couple transistors. Warning, don't kill yourself. That may be a little bit too much. Okay, well, I'm gonna find a power supply and I think we're gonna do that. Find a nice project for that. I already have a, uh, I already have a, what do you call it? A, what do you call it? A um, transformer, I already have a transformer that I can use. So. Perfect. I will figure that out. All right, guys. Uh, that will do it. How did we do today? Only about a half an hour. Excellent. Love that. All right. So if you have any questions, if you're watching this post live, that's all right. No big deal. Appreciate, appreciate you. Appreciate you coming in and saying hello, and and watching the stream. Well, I'm sorry. I just said if you're watching this post live. So. If you have any questions, if what I said doesn't make any sense, then um, feel free to post your questions in the comments and I will answer them post haste. Otherwise, do check out the links to Amazon. If you buy something on Amazon, I get a piece of the action. It's no more expensive um, than the regular price. I get you know, like 5% or something like that of the sale. And it helps my channel out, particularly since YouTube monies has really really took a dump um, it's it's crazy what they did the ad stuff I, I mention it all the time but any little bit keeps the channel going and I appreciate it all right guys Whew, excuse me all right that will do it for today take it easy and I will talk to you